Thanks, uh, thanks to you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here back again, uh, as I said, fourth or fifth time already. Let me see if uh, I can get uh, this uh, going. Okay, so it's, uh, it's the fourth or fifth time that uh, I come to Neuchâtel, uh, always because so, of thanks uh, uh, to Philip. And, uh, and it's, it's a pleasure to come uh, to Switzerland. Uh, I've been traveling a lot of, uh, to Switzerland just uh, for professional reasons uh, during many years. And, uh, and anyway, I mean, coming here is uh, a little bit uh, like coming back home. Um, so, as uh, Philippe mentioned, uh, I had uh, this, uh, this uh, honor of being uh, appointed as the 2021 Distinguished Lecture Lecturer for uh, the International Association of Mathematical Geology. And I was supposed to be touring the world, giving uh, talks uh, about mathematical geosciences and explaining how important uh, mathematics in geoscience are and informatics, and, uh, and just trying to lure people uh, to join the International Association of Mathematics and Geology if you are not a member yet. Um, 2021 has passed, uh, and in fact, I didn't travel anywhere to do any talk. So I, I told Philippe that I would take advantage of this talk as. Uh, my first and last uh, 2021 DL uh, lecture, and I will just uh, inform IMG that I actually did one, uh, one travel, and I did uh, uh, do act once as uh, the distinguished lecture uh, live uh, in front of an audience. So the association is, is an association with more than 800 uh, members uh, from all over the place uh, in 65 countries, and. Uh, and it promotes uh, the advancement of uh, mathematics, statistics, and uh, informatics uh, in the US science. It was founded in uh, 1968 uh, on occasion of the, uh, this 23rd uh, uh, Geological con Congress, and uh, it has been uh, running, I would say, successfully uh, ever since. Uh, we publish uh, a number of, uh, uh, the association publishes a number of uh, journals, uh, and again, if you are not a member of the association, I uh, encourage you to join the association and, uh, and also to try to publish on uh, a, any of, uh, of our journals. The flagship uh, journal is the Mathematical Geoscience, formerly known as Mathematical, uh, uh, mathematical Geology. Mathematical Geology. And uh, it started right with the uh, foundation of the of the association, and then we have uh, computers and geoscience, uh, we have natural resources research, uh, applied computing geoscience, and then there is a newsletter that is distributed uh, among the members of the association uh, with a bi-annual uh, uh, frequency. So uh, this would be the pitch just uh, to introduce uh, the fact that uh, this could have been one of those distinguished lecture uh, talks. And uh, let's go into the, into, the, into the talk. The talk, uh, this one is called, My name is Filter, Come on Filter. I'm sure that it reminds you of some uh, uh, movie. Okay, some uh, they would be like James Bond uh, introducing itself. Uh, I'm Jaime Gomez Hernandez from the Research Institute of Water and Environmental Engineering at the Technical University uh, of Valencia. Um, Philip said it, I like catchy titles, like uh, it's normal not to be Gaussian. Yeah? or uh, the danger of parsimony, or upscale invert goal, or disjuncting Kriegin, the untold story. This story was never told because uh, uh, the paper was submitted uh, to the author of the, uh, the creator of disjuncting Kriegin, and of course, I mean, he was very, very critical about it. So the untold story is still untold. I like short titles, like complexity. I like long titles, like the power of uh, transient isometric health data in uh, inverse modeling, uh, an application of the localized normal scoring thermal fitted with covariance inflation and in other heterogeneous bimodal hydraulic conductivity field, which is uh, the basis of the example I will show you uh, later. And I like, uh, as I said, controversial titles like this to be or not to be multi Gaussian that uh, Philippe mentioned before. And uh, I, I would like to say the, a little story about this paper. Uh, this paper was submitted to Water Resources Research uh, probably in 1989, 1990 for publication. And it came back to me uh, uh, with, I have suspicious, suspicious, I mean, uh, some suspicion about who could have been the reviewer. Uh, I, I never uh, found exactly. But uh, basically, it was, uh, the reviewer said that uh, 
uh, it was a pamphlet and uh, it should be published in some of these yellow press uh, journals or magazines like the National Enquirer. Uh, for those of you who haven't been to the U.S. and who may not know what the National Enquirer are or is, uh, it's, a, it's a magazine, it's one of these yellow magazines that you can buy uh, in the aisles of the supermarkets just while you are waiting for the cashier to, uh, to just cash uh, your, uh, your products. And uh, they have, uh, uh, it could be uh, like this one, uh, Angie's uh, deadly uh, liver damage, uh, pregnancy and wedding heartbreak. Uh, uh, 4 million tell a book, uh, Lonely Life has a hoarder, I don't know, adoption it's, it's this kind of uh, very uh, uh, sensationalist uh, uh, type of uh, news. So I, I figure myself like something like this. Okay, uh, to be or not to be would be Gaussian, the danger of parsimony by Jaime Gomez Hernandez in the, uh, in the cover of the National Enquirer. Uh, this paper was eventually published. Uh, I, I tried to publish in water resources research, but I got uh, uh, certainly, uh, I mean, I spoke even with the president of the hydrology division of uh, the American Geophysical Union just to ask, who, I mean, how come the editor didn't filter the reviewer and how come the paper was not, couldn't be published there? And, uh, and I was told that uh, Jaime stopped following this route because uh, uh, this is not going to be published, and it's better that you don't, uh, don't push it anymore. As I said, it was, uh, it was eventually published uh, in uh, 1998. Well, these 160 sites was when I wrote uh, this. Uh, right now, it's, it's, it's more than that. But anyways, it's not the, the, my most cited paper, but certainly one of the most cited papers that I, I have. And, uh, and basically, what we were trying, or what I was trying to do here, was to debunk uh, this uh, multi-Gaussian approach uh, that uh, was uh, the only uh, conception for the description of heterogeneity of hydraulic conductivities uh, uh, for hydrogeological hydrog 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 modeling that was in place. And, and at that time, it was the time of Dagan and Newman and uh, uh, all these people that started this uh, 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 stochastic hydrogeology. And they only thought about uh, this multi-Gaussian approach and, uh, and get going away fr from that. I mean, it was kind of a, a sin or kind of a heresy. So anyway, this is just the introduction uh, yes, uh, to be a little bit uh, light. So what is this uh, talk about? Uh, this talk about, uh, what I want to introduce you is uh, give you a very quick primer about the Kalman filter. Going from the very simple Kalman filter that uh, as introduced by Kalman in the, in the 60s uh, to the more complex uh, normal score and semi Kalman filter that I will be using later uh, for uh, the example that I will show you at the, at the very end. Uh, I will introduce you uh, to this common filtering from the, from the mind of a geostatistician because at the end, the equations using the common filtering are the same ones that you use in uh, simple cricket. And, and I will identify you the, the terms. I mean, it's exactly the same. I mean, the only, the only difference is, uh, is terminology, but at the end, you have exactly the same equations. And uh, I will show you an application to this uh, stochastic, stochastic inverse modeling applied uh, to hydrogeology to a, a bivariate uh, non-Gaussian conductivity field. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I will do. Uh, I keep receiving a, a phone call. Anyway, uh, so let's, uh, let's, uh, this is what I will be talking about. What, what did Kalman do to start with? So in 1960, uh, Kalman uh, uh, works uh, with these kind of uh, uh, linear systems, okay, these, uh, these systems that, tran that transit in time and that transition in time with a linear uh, uh, model, uh, in which basically the state of your system, which will be x at time t, depends linearly on the state of the system just uh, some time period, so in a previous step t, uh, t minus 1. Um, the gamma filter is, is an assimilation uh, procedure, uh, and I will explain uh, what, what I mean. And it was used for the first time in the Apollo missions that brought uh, uh, Neil Armstrong to the, to the moon. So it was, it was really, uh, really successful. So they work with this linear operator, and uh, uh, we are used to work in, in discretized environments, so uh, we could write this uh, uh, just basically in a 
vector matrix uh, expression with uh, a vector of uh, my states. At time t, depend uh, the, uh, on the states at time t minus 1 through some kind of uh, linear uh, operation. And this linear matrix will be this uh, matrix A. And I just, uh, for those of you who have not seen uh, Kalman filter or, or this nomenclature before, I just uh, uh, put this, uh, this equation here. So, so it's clear what, what, the, uh, what the linear operation means and what uh, the states are. So imagine that uh, what you are uh, uh, in the state, uh, you, are, you are considering just uh, one of these uh, unmanned vehicles. Okay, and this uh, vehicle is moving, uh, and uh, the state of the vehicle will be in the position and the velocity. So the state vector will be just uh, in 2D, uh, the position in X, the position in Y, the velocity in X, and the velocity in Y. Okay, and uh, this uh, state depends on the position that was just uh, one instant before, so delta T before, uh, X and Y in this uh, previous position, and also depends on this uh, uh, and the velocities in the previous position, in the previous instant. And uh, these two, I mean, the state at time t is related to the state at time t minus one through this matrix, uh, which we're, we have here just once in the diagonal. Delta t is up here, zero down here. Basically, we have this expression, as I told you, the state at time t depends linearly on the state at time t minus one through this matrix. And if we were to develop these equations, what we have is that uh, uh, x at time t is x at time t minus 1 times the velocity multiplied by the uh, delta t. y is the same, y at, t is y at t minus 1 plus the velocity in y multiplied times delta t. And we will assume that the velocity is just remains constant. Okay? So the velocity at time t is the same as the, at time t minus 1. This would be my uh, system equation, my state and dish transition uh, uh, equation. Okay. So that's uh, what I mean by the state uh, uh, of the system. In this case, are just position and velocity. And the fact that it evolves in time uh, in a linear way is because we have this uh, uh, linear uh, matrix here uh, that allows me to know exactly which will be able to predict which will be the state in the future based on the state uh, in the past through this uh, linear, linear process. Okay, so let me get back to here. So uh, this will be my, as I say, my state equation. And now let, let's imagine that, uh, I mean, my state equation, of course, is something that is not exact. So therefore, the position, I don't know it exactly. So there will be some variability about, uh, about it, some, some error about the location. Even, even, it, even the initial location, I will have some error in the, in the location. That, uh, so, so there is some, some kind of variability. So maybe it's not the best to just uh, represent it with a deterministic variable, but rather let's use, uh, consider this is a random function. Okay? Each one of the elements of this uh, state is a random variable, which has some kind of mean value, some kind of variance, and, and there will be some covariance between the different elements. Because, uh, as I said, uh, uh, probably my, uh, my expression is not exactly correct. Maybe the velocities are not uh, always constant. Uh, so maybe my, my state is not, as I said, uh, perfectly known. And, uh, and also, because I haven't started, I mean, I don't, so, no, don't know exactly which were my initial x, y, and, uh, and v, v, x, v, y. So imagine that, uh, because there is uncertainty, some uncertainty about uh, the state of my system, so I represent this not with a deterministic variable, but rather with uh, a random variable. And uh, if, uh, if this is uh, so, then I can compute the expected value uh, of my random variable, like the best estimate in a least square sense. And uh, the expected value, you can take it here, expected values, and you will get this, okay? The expected value at uh, time t will be no other than the expected value of time t minus 1 multiplied by, uh, by this uh, linear transition matrix because uh, the expected value is linear and, uh, and you can just basically uh, apply it here. And you can also compute the covariance. It's a little bit more uh, cumbersome to get to this expression, but uh, after a little bit of algebra, 
you know that the covariance of these uh, uh, random variables that you have here in the state vector will be the covariance at time t minus 1 multiplied uh, before and after by the linear transition uh, uh, matrix and its uh, transpose. Okay, so that's the way you will compute this, uh, this covariance. And you can propagate this covariance, which in a sense is the error that you have in your prediction. So it propagates in time uh, with uh, using, making use of this uh, uh, function A that you have developed from your state transition system. So the point is that at, at this time, so I, I am uh, at time t, I have made my prediction about which is the state of my system. So I predicted where my vehicle is located, which is the velocity of the vehicle, using the state transition equation that I mentioned. So I have made, I have made the prediction. So in fact, I have made the prediction of its expected value, and I have made the prediction of its uh, variance or its covariance. And then I get some information. I get some extra information. I have some observation, which is looking at the unmanned vehicle and tells me, well, uh, from here what I see is that the position is x and y, and the velocity is, uh, is vx and vy. And those values may not coincide with the, the prediction that we have here, uh, if we take this expected value as the best prediction of my state. Okay, so they have extra information and what I'm going to do is I'm going to correct my prediction, my best estimate of the position, using the conditional expectation of my predicted variable at time t, given that I have observed uh, with some uh, apparatus, with some device, I have observed my state also. And of course, this observation is not precise. I mean, there will be some error in the observation. Okay, so you expect to have some deviation from, from the prediction, First, because the prediction is not exact, probably, I mean, you, your system is not exactly correct, and also because your observations are not exact. So you expect to have some deviation. But then you have, let's say, the best estimate of your position given by, by this expected value, and now you correct this expected value conditional to the observation. And this uh, correction is not on other than uh, your uh, prior estimate, the estimates before you take the observation, plus a correction, okay, uh, this well, you have here this multiplicative factor that depends on the deviation between the observation and the prediction. Okay, so is, if observations and predictions are the same, they say, well, then, then your model is working perfectly, there is not, nothing to correct. Okay, so if observation coincides with the prediction, it says the method is working perfectly and my uh, expected values or my, my prediction should be exactly what the forward model told me. I mean, what the application of this forward modeling is telling me. But as soon as there is some deviation, then uh, we are going to apply a correction. And this correction is uh, this K thing here, you see here, this K, this K matrix, which is called the Kalman gain, which for those of you who are geostatisticians, happens to be exactly the weights of the creaking, so the, the, the simple creaking weights. Uh, and it's a matrix because uh, this is a vector, so we are estimating uh, all, all the variables. We are estimating x, y, vx, and vi. So we have weights for the estimation of, of each one of those. So we have here a matrix, but this matrix contains the simple creaking weights that you will obtain if you start with the covariance of your state, I mean, it's ex exactly with these covariances and, and, and all that. So this, uh, as I said, this, uh, this Kriging, I mean, this Kalman gain is a function of the covariance at this time t. And uh, I'm not going to enter into the derivation, but uh, the important thing is that those coincide with the simple Kriging weights that you will obtain uh, when you do simple Kriging. So there is a, there is a very close relationship uh, with uh, Kriging. What I said is not completely true, okay, because generally in Kriging you don't account for the errors in the observation. You assume that the data is always correct, and then if you account for the errors in the observation, that expression has changed a little bit, but fundamentally it's the same, and the way you, I mean, the way you, you reach the results is exactly the same. It's minimization of uh, some squares between the predictions and the observations, uh, exactly the same process as uh, you do to get to the creaking weights. So this is what Kalman did, and uh, it worked very well for, for linear vectors, for linear systems, uh, systems that progress in time using this, uh, this linear operator. 
Okay, and these uh, these are the equations that uh, they use, uh, and, and, and intuitively they are very very simple. I mean, it's clear that uh, yeah, I mean you correct your estimate of your prediction when you forecast the the position of your uh, of your vehicle in this case by taking the forecast plus some correction which depends on the deviation between the observation and the forecast. Okay, so. Uh, as I said, this is how as Kalman uh, put it, and uh, the Kalman filter has two steps. Okay, the first step will be this one here, which is forecast. So you forecast, which will be your expected value of the state and the covariance of your state in the next time step, and then you basically uh, assimilate the data, and then there is an update. So there is forecast and update. Okay, so. This is, I mean, if this is more or less clear, uh, I will now explain you simply what happens when you want to apply this to more complex cases, because as I said, this, is, this works only for linear systems. Um, soon after, uh, no, I, in fact, I put you here, no, it's, it's, the same, it's the same equation, I'm sorry. Uh, I told you that it's a function of the covariance, and the function is this one here, okay, so the covariance the conditional covariance of x given the observations is equal to the identity, identity mat matrix minus the Kalman gain multiplied by the, uh, by the covariance of x, x of t. Okay, so you compute the conditional expect expectation of your uh, position and the, co and the conditional covariance of your uh, update position. So you have, and this will be the uh, expected value and the covariance that you will use to make the next prediction that will go in here to make the next forecast and to make the next uh, uh, update. Okay, so you compute, as I said, both the conditional expectation and the conditional co covariances that become the real expectations and covariances to be used for the forecast uh, in the next step. So, well, basically, what you see here is uh, this is your uh, unmanned vehicle uh, moving around, and basically, and, uh, and what you have is uh, your prediction. No. Yes, mission control is making some prediction with a model which is not perfectly exact. So this is the prediction of the model. Then you take a measurement, and the measurement tells you that the vehicle is here, and there is a correction that says, well, maybe it's here. And from here, you make again uh, a new prediction of where the vehicle is going. And uh, the truth one is the is the, the, is the, dash, the, the solid line. And then there is another uh, observation which is very close to the prediction, so there is no correction here. Uh, there is more prediction from mission control. It tells you that uh, the vehicle is here, but uh, actually the measurement is here, so there is another correction. So that's how it works. Okay, so you make a prediction, an observation, and then there is a correction based on the difference between the prediction and the observation, and you keep assimilating real data as time, uh, as time passes. Uh, what happens when uh, you have a nonlinear operator? Uh, this was developed in the 60s. Computers were not uh, still. I mean, uh, this was programmed in a, in a tiny computer that went in the in the Apollo in the Apollo mission. Uh, it could be, uh, but uh, I mean, they didn't have uh, too many tools at that time to do uh, much uh, much more complex uh, things. So what happens is the operator is nonlinear. What happens is my my uh, dynamics of my system evolves in time in a way which is nonlinear. So I can I can I, I know which is the uh, uh, evolution of uh, of my state. As a function of the state in the in, in a previous moment, but is a nonlinear operator, which would be basically, say, a transient groundwater uh, groundwater model. Okay, the heads at the time t depend in a nonlinear way from the heads at time t minus one. So, what do you do when uh, the operator is nonlinear? Well, they said I can approximate. I can go again to my discretized uh, version, and I can approximate my state, my vector of state, as a linear combination of the states at time t minus 1 uh, with uh, some matrix A that will be approximated by uh, the, basically the Jacobian of this function with respect to the variables. So I have here an approximated uh, function that will allow me to forecast my state in, in, in the future uh, using a linear uh, operator because uh, I need this linear operator to be able to uh, propagate my expected value, if I consider that this is a random variable, it to propagate my covariance. Mm -hmm. So when, uh, when I have this relationship, I know 
how to compute my expected, the expected value of my, my state variable in the next time step and the covariance of my uh, state variable in the next time step. Uh, and if it's not linear, I cannot do it uh, easily. Okay? I cannot do it, at, at least I cannot do it analytically. So they said, well, m this may work. If this approximation, I mean, uh, is, is, uh, is acceptable. And, uh, and you just yeah, basically apply the same equations as before. The expected value, the conditional to the observations will be the expected value uh, after the forecast plus the correction, uh, which multiplies the difference between the observations and the, and the forecast. But the problem is that this, uh, this approach deteriorates very quickly. Mm, so this covariance keeps moving in time, but uh, because this is an approximated equation, this covariance departs very quickly from the true covariance that uh, will be uh, associated with this nonlinear function. If you were able to, to somehow compute the covariance for that nonlinear state transition function. So uh, it, it apparently it was a, a great thing. It was something that, uh, that could be used, but uh, eventually it was discarded. I mean, extended candle, the extended candle filter never had a much uh, application, much impact. So then is when Evansen came. And uh, Evansen uh, had this uh, bright idea to say, my system moves in time non-linearly, and rather than trying to find an uh, analytical expression on, to, to compute how my system evolves in time, since I say that my state uh, is represented by, by random variables, and that's uh, the way I'm, I'm modeling it, then why, why don't I generate many realizations of my state variable? I generate many realizations. I run each realization through my nonlinear operator, and I get the realizations at time t. So I, I know exactly how, as I said, I, I start with many realizations, and I just propagate those in time individually. And then what I will do is uh, I'm not going to use any analytical expression to compute the expected value of uh, my state variables, but rather I will take the expected value of my uh, forecast realizations. And I will compute the covariance of uh, my forecast values by taking the covariance of these forecast realizations. And these are fully consistent with my nonlinear operator because each one of the forecast variables has been computed using the nonlinear uh, equation, state transition uh, equation. So uh, here, I mean, in these ways, we are solving the problem we had with the extended Kalman filter. That uh, the calculation of this expected value and this covariance deteriorated with time. Because right now, I'm ensuring that uh, all these uh, excess, I mean, all these realizations which are used to compute the expected value and the covariance, they are always consistent with the state transition equation. For hydrogeologists, I mean, this. Okay, this X uh, could be just the, uh, the, the hydraulic heads uh, at time t minus 1, and you, you just propagate it on time t, and then you can compute the expected value of, the, of these uh, realizations at time t and the covariance of these uh, piezometric heads at time t. So this solved this problem of the extended thermal filter, and, uh, and then you can just uh, basically update not uh, the expected value or the covariance, but you update each one of those realizations. So each one of the forecast realizations are updated by applying to each one of them a correction that depends on the difference between the observations, which is unique, and the um, forecast values at different, uh, at the different realizations. Okay, so I have exactly the same expression as before, but now, now I apply it individually to each one of those realizations. And then these realizations will become the values that I will use to predict, uh, to forecast, I'm sorry, to forecast my uh, state in the next time step. So each time that I assimilate data, each time that I get uh, observations Y, then what I do is I correct the state of my system by analyzing the differences between the observations and uh, the predicted values, the forecast values in each, in each realization. So this uh, semi kalman filter, uh, it proved to circumvent this problem of the nonlinearity, and it's, it's, it's very robust. Okay? It's, uh, it's working 
uh, very nicely. So after those, these many questions, let me show you just uh, a picture from Valencia. Uh, so you haven't been to Valencia. This is uh, the part of the Opera House uh, near the riverbed uh, of the, the old riverbed of, of the Turia River that crosses uh, uh, the city. So then send the camera filter. How does it work? Uh, as I said, what, do you, what you will do is uh, you generate many realizations. Then uh, you solve the state equation for each realization. With the solution of this uh, state equation, you compute the ensemble statistics, the average, or the ensemble mean, and the ensemble uh, covariance. And then you apply this, uh, uh, this equation, this clicking equation, as I told you, to update each one of those realizations. And then with this update, then you do another prediction. And when you get the new observations, then you will make another correction with us, those observations. So it's, it's again, it's a, it's a two-step uh, uh, approach. Uh, forecast until the instant that you have new observations. And then you collect the observations and correct and update your realizations. And then you forecast again and, uh, and update it again. OK? But uh, so far, so far, I have spoken only about the state of the system. Okay? So this is always correcting the state of the system. And uh, many of you, I'm sure, are working in, in inverse modeling in hydrogeology. And, and you are not interested in, cor I mean, you are interested in correcting the state of the, of, I mean, to get the best estimate of the hydraulic heads. But at the end, you are always thinking that the, what you should be aiming, aiming at is to obtain the best estimate of the hydraulic conductivity, so the parameters that control this state equation. Not, I mean, and if you control those parameters, then you will control the, the response of the, of the state equation. So let, let's move uh, one step further. Okay, and see how we combine the ensemble gamma filter with inverse model. And this is done by keeping the same, the same philosophy. This is, this is done by building what is called an augmented vector. So your state is not just only the state itself. So it's not just only the position plus the velocities. It's the pos position plus the velocities plus the parameters that control uh, the system. In this specific case, there are, there are no parameters, but you could think about some acceleration that uh, could be changing the velocity in time. So there could be some parameters that are actually changing, I mean, are the responsible of, of uh, the, the variability on, on this specific example. In, uh, in our hydrogeological model, we'll be just modifying the conductivity, so the porosities. So, so we have now a new state. Is the state of the system itself so the piezometric heads, and the parameters that control those uh, piezometric heads, the conductivities, the porosities. The state could also be the concentrations. Okay, you could have concentrations, piezometric heads, porosities, and permeability. That could be our new augmented state. And then we know that uh, uh, it, it progresses in time. <clears throat> the state goes from t2 minus 1 to t by applying the forward function, okay, the, the, basically the numerical model in this case. And for the, uh, for the parameters, we will say that just basically when you are forecasting the parameters, the parameters don't change. Okay? When I say my, my parameters for uh, time t plus 1 are the same that I had estimated for time t. What happens is that when I take some observations, I will use the difference between the observations and the predictions for my state, for, for this part here, for the x, to correct both the state and the parameter. Okay, so what I, it, it will happen is I change now, rather than using uh, this, this compound uh, vector, I, I have just a vector z with uh, both states and parameters, that will depend on my vector z at t minus 1 through a new function psi that combines uh, this uh, state transition equation plus this, uh, just keep the parameters the same from uh, t, t, t times t minus 1 to time t. So, but once I have uh, basically reformulated my problem exactly the same as I was using it before, I can do exactly as before. I, I can generate my realizations of uh, the, both the parameters and the solution of the flow equation, and then I can move that in time, okay, by solving this equation. So 
So I can do the same thing. I can just generate many realizations here and uh, move them in time. So I do my forecast. Then uh, I compute my uh, average, uh, my ensemble mean and my ensemble covariance from the realizations. And then I can do my correction when I take some observations. So I will get a correction. And these corrections will correct me the state of the system, the piezometric heads, but will also correct me the, uh, the conductivities. Okay, because I will have here this covariance will be the covariance between the piezometric heads and the conductivities, and the conductivities with themselves and the piezometrics with themselves. Okay, so we have here all the covariances and all the cross covariances between state and parameters of the of the state equation. Okay, so you can uh, you can correct, uh, so you can update the values of the parameters uh, as time goes by, as new information is being uh, is being gathered. Okay. So, so this is this is the way the, the way. I mean, this is this is uh, uh, this this application is the one that uh, basically gained uh, lots of attention in petroleum engineering. I mean, uh, all of a sudden, uh, in the, I would say at the end of the 1990s, uh, basically all oil companies, uh, starting basically with the Norwegians, uh, discovered this this possibility of doing inverse modeling using the uh, ensemble gamma filter. Because there is no, as you see, there is no optimization here. The only thing you are doing is uh, is this Kriegen equation. Uh, this Kriegen equ equation applied to the many realizations, and this allows you to actually uh, refine, I mean, correct uh, after several iterations, correct it after several iterations, and get a, a, a very good estimate of uh, the parameters of the model. So, um, the good thing about uh, this approach is, is uh, if the function, the, transcend, the, the state transcend equation is linear and, uh, and you are using a multi Gaussian model, then uh, you can ensure that uh, the update parameters are fully coherent with the observations. Uh, in the sense that, uh, uh, if, as I said, if this were to be linear, if this were to be linear and the model you use is multi Gaussian, when you obtain here these predictions and you have predictions for the state and predictions for the parameters, there is full coherence. I mean, if you were to solve the equation, uh, the flow equation for those parameters, it will give you the predicted uh, uh, observations. When this is nonlinear, that doesn't happen. Uh, you have some predicted parameters, and maybe the values of the state are not fully consistent with the predicted parameters. So that requires to do something else. Okay? That requires to do one additional uh, modification. But. Uh, I mean, if you are linear in Gaussian, then everything is, uh, is fully coherent and, and is uh, optimal in, in some sense. So, uh, the good thing of uh, Ensemble Gamma Filter for uh, inverse modeling is that uh, it works very well for Gaussian fields, even for nonlinear functions. Okay, so, even in that case, it works uh, uh, very well. And uh, it's very efficient because there's no optimization. I mean, as I said, the only thing you have to do is compute this. Uh, uh, experimental mean and experimental covariance and use this Kriegen equation. That's, uh, that's all you, you have to do. It's, you know, it's, it's very quick and, and, and fast. Some disadvantages, uh, there is, uh, because these covariances, at the end, the only thing that the covariances captures is the linear relationship between uh, the, the, the values at time t and the values at, t, at time t, t plus one. I mean, you don't have this, uh, this uh, linear relationship between the state and between the parameters. Then, at the end, when you apply it many times, even if you start with realizations which are very far from Gaussian, this application of this uh, Kriegen equation uh, that is based on the covariances, uh, at the end, yields, yields you results which are uh, Gaussian. Okay, so you start with something which is not Gaussian, and you update it, update it, update it, update it, update it and at, at the end, it looks Gaussian. Okay, so, so it's good for Gaussian uh, cases, even if it's nonlinear, but um, they, they is better uh, better big option some other problems is that uh, because you are estimating the mean and the covariance using uh, this experimental approach i mean using these many realizations you need two i mean you, you need many realizations to get a good estimate of the mean and the covariance if you use too few realizations then the covariance is always underestimated uh, and the mean may be not very well estimated so you need to have enough number of members in your uh, ensemble so that you can get a good estimate of, uh, of the mean and the covariance. 
Uh, because of that, if the ensemble is not too large, then what happens is that it tends to collapse. I mean, the variability, it, it keeps decreasing uh, as the assimilation moves, as time moves, and then everything collapses uh, uh, into something which may be correct or not. So uh, you, you want to keep some uncertainty about your estimates uh, all the time. Uh, the experimental covariance doesn't have to be positive definite. Okay, so sometimes the solution may, may give you some problems. Uh, because uh, it's experimental. I mean, you are not fitting any 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 one of the allowed uh, covariance functions uh, to these experimental calculations, and, uh, and because of that, uh, there could be some kind of spurious correlations uh, between points which are very far apart that uh, may appear as they they are correlated when they are not. I mean, it's just uh, correlations that appear in the in the calculations, but uh, they are uh, fictitious. So some solutions to these problems are. The covariance localization, covariance inflation, and the normal score transform. Uh, I don't think I'm going to enter much into these two here, into, into the localization and the inflation. I will just tell you about the normal score transform, which is crucial, is critical, if you want to deal with non-Gaussian uh, uh, variables. So the normal score transform, I mean, is, uh, we, are, uh, we are starting from the same point. I mean, we have this... Uh, a state transition equation that uh, moves my, in this case, my augmented vector that contains both a state and parameters from time t minus 1 to time t. So I have this equation. And uh, we said this works perfectly if, both, if z is uh, Gaussian both before and after. Uh, if this is linear and this is Gaussian, this will be Gaussian I mean, by default. But when, when this is not linear, uh, if this is Gaussian, this doesn't have to be, this will not be Gaussian, and if this is non-Gaussian, I mean, both of them will be non-Gaussian. So if we start with something which is non-Gaussian, because we know that our conductivities are non-Gaussian, then uh, to apply the ensemble gamma filter and get optimal results, you should have Gaussian variables. So the only thing we are going to do is to transform both Zt and Zt minus 1 into Gaussian variables, at least marginally Gaussian. Uh, you will not be able to do it multi-Gaussian, but at least marginally Gaussian. So what you will do is uh, reformulate this expression with another expression that relates uh, ut and ut minus 1. But the u is not only that the, Gaussian, the normal score transform of uh, the predictions, and the ut minus 1 is the normal score transform of uh, the, uh, the values at, the, at t minus 1. And what is this? Uh, I mean, how do you, how do you move in time? This, uh, this expression, how, uh, what is this uh, uh, transition equation here, this, uh, this capital gamma? Well, as I said, if, uh, if u is the normal square transform of z and u t minus 1 is the normal square transform of z t minus 1, and you, and, and you can know which are these, uh, these equations, these transformations, then uh, you do a little bit of algebra and you, you find that the capital gamma will be uh, this convolution of the normal score transform at t multiplied by uh, the state transition equation multiplied by the normal score at t minus 1 inverse. Okay. So it's, I mean, it's a little bit uh, complex, but I mean, you can find out which is the state transition equation. You can find that one. And then you can work in normal space. So you will ensure that uh, when at the end you back transform your predictions into real space, and then uh, everything will be, I mean, you will preserve this non-normality, this non-normal uh, situations that uh, I was talking about. Okay, so, yet, uh, so to put a little bit of relax, let me show you another picture of, uh, of, the, of, uh, of Valencia. And uh, let, me, let me just uh, put you just a summary here. So, I don't know if you can see it well. So, we started with, uh, with a linear system, and, and at the end, everything is the same. It's this transition equation in time. Uh, you start from uh, your, uh, your state at t minus 1, and it moves on t linearly. That was Kalman, and you can express it uh, as a simple uh, matricial equation. The extended Kalman filter uses a nonlinear function, but then there's an approximation in this linear, in linear thing, so it, it never worked well. The ensemble common filter, what you do is uh, you substitute uh, the single, uh, the random variable, but many realizations that evolve in time according to the uh, system, uh, uh, system transition equation. 
The augmented SMF Kanban filter, what does is brings the parameters into the state equation, so you update not only the state, but also the parameters. And, uh, and then the normal score, basically what it does is just, uh, it takes normal scores of both, uh, makes that both sides of the equation here are Gaussian, and therefore uh, you ensure that uh, you will have, uh, uh, basically, the semi Kanban filter will be applied to Gaussian variables. Okay, you will be applying it to these uh, u variables rather than to the x variables. You apply to these u variables that are Gaussian, and then you ensure that uh, the Gaussian, the Gaussianity is kept uh, in in the loop. Okay. So I'm going to show you uh, just an application uh, of the normal score in semi Kanban filter uh, with this uh, bimodal uh, reference thing. So, let me change the light. So, what uh, we are aiming with this uh, inverse uh, modeling approach is uh, we want to generate uh, realizations of the conductivity uh, so that when we solve the flow equation, we get realizations of the hydraulic head that are consistent with the observed values of hydraulic head uh, at the different time steps that we do. Okay. So at the end, I'm looking for representations of the conductivity that uh, when I solve the equation in each one of those, each realization matches my observed uh, piezometric heads. That's uh, what we are aiming at. Okay. And we are going to be using this ensemble camel filter. So I will generate initially a bunch of realizations of, of uh, conductivity. I will start with some initial heads. And then I will I will make predictions in time, take some observations, and uh, comparing the observations with the predictions of my model, I will keep updating the, uh, the conductivity fields. The updating will be applied only to the conductivity fields because of this inconsistency between the updated conductivity and the updated piezometric heads, which you can also update with the camera filter. There could be some inconsistency. So what we do is that we update the conductivities, and then for the next time step, rather than running the state, trans the state transition equation from t minus 1, we run from time 0. Okay, so we ensure that all the way from time 0 to the present, there is consistency on the, on the piezometric head. Okay, so I'll show you the reference field. Uh, the reference field is built uh, with first some kind of uh, facies simulation and then uh, the facies are populated with conductivities. Uh, this is log conductivities. Um, then uh, we sample this uh, log conductivity map with uh, some observations uh, of, uh, of a logarithm of uh, conductivity. Uh, plenty of them, three times three is, uh, that is like uh, 11 by 11. So it's 120 observations of uh, conductivity. And then we will be running uh, the, the forward model of, uh, it's a synthetic example, of course. We will be running the forward model and, uh, and basically sampling in, uh, for piezometric heads at the location that you see here. Uh, I don't know how many there are, but there are, there are quite a few. There are 40 or so uh, observations. So we have many observations of conductivity, many observations of uh, piezometric heads. This is my marginal distribution of the, of the conductivities, clearly by model, clearly non Gaussian. So, as I said, the first examples we try of the ensemble Kalman filter without the normal score transform, we start with many realizations that uh, basically follow these patterns. Okay, we use some kind of training image to generate first the facies and then to fill in the, uh, the conductivities. You start with many realizations like that. But as you keep updating them, you keep updating them, at the end, the distribution of the conductivity is Gaussian. This covariance thing uh, is basically brings this Gaussian flavor into the, into the updated values at the end. Okay, so the only way to get back the bivariate uh, distribution is to use this uh, normal score uh, transformation uh, before and after. So before making the prediction and after making the prediction. So uh, let me show you some results. Uh, this is, for instance, uh, one of the realizations uh, generated, number 550, I think there were 1,000 1, realizations we, we use here. This realization, uh, you can say it already looks 
somehow similar to the reference because you have 120 conditioning data. So we have lots of conditioning data here. Uh, yet the mean of all the 1,000 realization looks like this. Uh, you can see that, I mean, the, the channels are more or less this there because of this conditioning data. And uh, this is, uh, well, this is another scenario. I mean, I ran a couple of scenarios uh, as a report right now, which is the difference. They probably have more conditioning data here. I don't recall right now, which has the, the difference between the two. Don't, don't worry. And this is the reference. So uh, what uh, this is what uh, what you can see. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, I missed something. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. So this is the initial. This is this are the mean. Okay. So if you, we run now the seven command filter. Okay, we do the seven command filter. And uh, after uh, assimilating, uh, I don't recall, uh, there was like uh, 40 time steps. So you run uh, 40, say 40 days, uh, and you take 40 days of observations, and you correct the, uh, the realizations. This would be the, the final updated realization number 550. Uh, because recall, the, in the summer command filter, what you are doing, you are uh, you start with one realization and you update each realization after you take the observations. So after uh, doing these uh, updating, this will be the, uh, the look of the realization number uh, 550, and this will be the mean of the 1,000 realization. Okay, this is the result already of, uh, of this application of the semicamel filter, this is the normal score and semicamel filter in this, uh, in this example. And it looks, I mean, it looks very good. I mean, you compare it with the with the reference. Uh, yeah, the mean is, is a good estimate of the of the reference, and any of the realizations is very much uh, close uh, to the uh, to the real thing. If you look at the uh, evolution of the piezometric heads, uh, uh, I didn't mention. I should have mentioned that uh, basically flow is from left to right, and there is a pumping uh, along this uh, edge here and this prescribed head here. Uh, and this is transient, so we start with uh, flat values of, uh, of the piezometric head, and then we start pumping out of here, uh, and then there is this wave kind of front moving from, from right to left of the piezometric heads that are just going down, uh, trying to adapt to the, to the pumping that is uh, happening in, in, this, in this edge. So this is uh, the, basically the flow. And as I said, we took, uh, we, we run 40 time steps. We take observations in those 40 time steps and did 40 corrections of uh, our results. And this is what uh, what you get, which is pretty good. This will be the uh, the true piezometric head uh, in two control points. This will be all the piezometric heads uh, in all the realization, the 1,000 realizations at the beginning, and this is uh, the true piezometric heads and the realizations at the end. And uh, again, it there were uh, like 40 time steps here of uh, basically assimilation and then, then, then it's just prediction. There's no, no more corrections in, in the following, so you see that the prediction is pretty good with, a li with very little uh, deviation with respect to the observed uh, piezometric heads. And then, uh, well, this is uh, the initial standard deviation, so you take the average of uh, the, uh, the standard deviation pixel by pixel through the 1,000 initial realizations. And uh, this is uh, how the standard deviation evolves in time. This is after the first uh, assimilation, after uh, the 10th assimilation, and after the 50th assimilation. So you see how the uncertainty that will be represented by the red values here with the largest uh, standard deviation goes uh, decreasing, and at the end, there is only uncertainty at the, end, at the edges of the, of the chart, basically. That's, uh, the only remaining uncertainty is right there. Larger than centering close to the piezometric, the constant piezometric heads, because uh, there the head information is lesser, no? the, the head is fixed, so, so there is no much variability on the heads, and uh, it, is, it doesn't matter much how much is the conductivity, because your head is not going to change much, it's fixed by the constant uh, head on the, on the left, but at the end, the sound deviation is, is pretty, it's pretty nice, it's pretty, pretty much reduced everywhere. So you may say, well, but you have too many conditioning data. What uh, if you have less conditioning data? So you, we remove from 120, we remove basically 80% uh, of the data, and then uh, we left only 16 data. And uh, in that case, 
This will be the average of the 1,000 realizations conditional to 16 data. This is realization one, 550. Uh, you run again the uh, semi-common filter. This is how uh, this realization evolves in time, and this is how the mean looks like uh, after the, 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 the 50 time steps. And it, 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 it looks, sorry, uh, I, don't, I don't have the reference back, but it, it looks good. I mean, still with 16 data, I mean, you, you can get. Uh, very good uh, results. So, uh, and someone said, well, maybe you have too many data. Uh, so what if you don't have any data? What if you don't have any data and you don't know anything about uh, the conductivity? And uh, these, are the, these are the best results. Okay, in this case, we start at time zero. We know nothing about the conductivity. So our 1,000 first realizations, they are 1,000 1, homogeneous values taken just basically from the bivariate distribution that you saw. So the only information we have is the by distribution. And we will generate 1,000 realizations, homogeneous, with this average value equal to just the average of the by distribution and with a constant variance, uh, which is not so constant because at the end, uh, when you do these uh, generations, I don't know what happened, it doesn't show up just as, a, as a solid uh, value, but it should be just constant variance everywhere. Okay, so we have no information, no conditioning data on the, on the conductivities. And then we run this uh, ensemble gamma filter, and which means basically I lowered the, I start pumping out here uh, from uh, levels initially at zero, and, and this pumping, as I said, it produces this front that it will go from uh, from right to left, and uh, as the front progresses, it also progresses the discovery of the features in the hydraulic conductivity field. Okay, so after five assimilation steps, you start seeing the channels which are close to the right edge. And this is the variance. You start re removing the uncertainty about your conductivity close to the right edge. And after 60 uh, assimilation steps, you get something which is pretty good uh, approximation of the of the reference field. This is these are the mean. Uh, this is the mean of the of the 1,000 realization. This is the uh, standard deviation of the 100 1,000 realization, which again basically leaves you uncertainty on the edges of the of the channel. So even when you start with uh, no information about the conductivity, you can get uh, a final estimate which is uh, pretty close. I mean, pretty, pretty, pretty. Uh, I mean, good with respect to the to the reference value. We look at the evolution of the piezometric heads. Uh, it's the same thing. These are the 1,000 realizations. Yeah, initially here the spread is even larger than before because, yeah, I mean, uh, it was homogeneous fields uh, all over the place. But after uh, you condition everything uh, on the observations, you get uh, a very reduced uh, variability. And then we also did some kind of uh, transport simulation. Uh, so this will be the transport, uh, just some particle tracking. And this is the particle tracking on the, in the reference. And, uh, and we took just a couple of control planes in this location. And at this location, we release particles from here, from the left to the right. And what you see is uh, here, I mean, maybe you don't, you don't notice very well because the, the lines are very thin. This is the true thing, okay? This is the spread of the predictions on the initial uh, ensemble. It's very wide and the mean is very far from the truth. Okay, this is again in control plane B. This is the spread of the transport. Uh, as you see it in control plane B, this is the, the true breakthrough curve. This is the spread of the of the pressure curves in the 1,000 realizations. This is the median of the of the realizations. Once you condition, once you do all the semi-comma filter and you correct the parameters and all that, uh, you can see that uh, the spread is reduced very much. The median of uh, the 1,000 realization is almost on top of the real breakthrough group in control plane A, and almost perfectly in control in control plane B. So, I mean, it, it, it does a, a very good uh, job. So, in summary, uh, I said this normal score in semi thermal filter is, is a very powerful method for inverse modeling in uh, uh, complex systems. And uh, it's conceptually very simple, I would say. It's, uh, it's this uh, forecast updating, forecast updating. And the updating is based on the difference between the forecast and the, and the, and the observations. And... Uh, and it could be, I mean, the, the truth is that, as I show you, I mean, we have been doing some tweaks here and there, 
uh, I didn't tell you about localization and coverage inflation, which are very important for the method uh, to work. So you have some tweaks like uh, direct simulation. I mean, you still have some knobs to uh, adjust to make the, the method to work uh, nicely. And uh, if you are using many realizations, it could take uh, some time to, to work. And uh, since uh, not everybody in life is, uh, is science or maths, uh, I tell you, I, I like to sing in, in, in a choir, and uh, it's, it's myself uh, in the choir of uh, La Field du Regiment and Donizetti. Uh, in, in probably the opera I, I enjoy the most play, play uh, in that. So, if you don't know, my name is Gomez. I'm Gomez Hernandez.